Amen. Well, good morning, church. Happy New Year. I'm expecting great things this year. I hope you are, too. <laughs> Someone said to me, it can't get any worse than last year, and I'm like, let's hope not. <laughs> we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you'll turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 15. And I've entitled this message, True Love. Do you know what true love is? Have you experienced true love? And I say that pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ because that is really true love. He has a love for you like I don't think we will ever understand until we're standing in His presence. He has poured out His love to us in such a mighty and powerful way and as parents, we can start to understand that love as we have an unconditional love for our children. But still, I don't think we've grasped on to the total and complete understanding of the love that Jesus Christ has for each and every one of us. You are so dear to Him. And I remember a little kid, a story of a little kid that came to his dad and, and he said, Dad, is it true that God sees everything I do? And his dad said, yes, he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. That's the love of our Father. So let's read this very, oh, gentle, loving portion of Scripture that exposes the heart of Paul to the Corinthians exposes his deep feelings for them it it almost makes him vulnerable to show these corinthians how much they mean to him that he doesn't want anything from them but he wants everything for them and we're going to see the apostle paul expressed a christ-like love that he could only get from jesus himself and so let's read verses 11 through 15. Paul says, I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you, in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me for this wrong. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Father, we thank you for the Word of God, and we just pray that Lord, you would help us to understand the depths of your love and that we could be an image, a mere image of you and that people could see that we have your love in us. And our hopes and our dreams is that people would have mistaken us for you. And so, Lord, we, can, we know that we can only do that by a complete surrender to you to realize that I can't do anything apart from you. I can't love apart from you. And so, Lord, open our eyes right now to your word and to what the Holy Spirit wants to show each and every one of us this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul makes himself very vulnerable here, expressing his love for the Corinthians, um, expecting nothing in return. That's not in our nature. We many times love because we expect something in return. We many times do things for others because we're expecting something in, in return. But when you really understand the depths of the true love of God, you love no matter what the results are. It's unconditional. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, God so loved the world, but the world won't be saved by God's love. The world will only be saved by responding to God's love and asking for forgiveness of their sins and asking Jesus to come into their heart. 
And I think all of us here are understanding the love of God greater than we did when we first got saved. But I have a real feeling that we haven't really discovered all of God's love and how deep it is and what true love is. Paul had this tremendous love for the Corinthians. This is a group of people that mistreated him. They put him down. They were talking bad about him. It says here, we just read that when, when the Judaizers who crept in, these guys who weren't of God, who were preaching a different message, who were leading the Corinthians astray, Paul says, when they started talking bad about me, you should have stood up for me, but you didn't. Paul says, I came to you with the gospel. I came to you with truth. I've never asked anything of you. I never took a penny from you. I was interested in you, not your stuff. That's the heart of Jesus. Paul poured out his life. He said, I would give anything for you. His biggest concern was the church. We looked a couple weeks ago at all the stuff that Paul went through. These Judaizers, these false teachers, these false apostles came into Corinth with another gospel, leading people astray, wanting to be lifted up, wanting to have the the preeminence, all the authority. They were getting paid large amounts of money. The Corinthians thought, well, the more you pay, the more important they should be. Paul didn't ask for anything, so how important can he be? He can't possibly be an apostle. And they were leading the people astray, and it was breaking the heart of Paul. And they were listening to fools. And so Paul says, listen, you know, it seems that all you listen to is fools anymore, and you listen to foolish things, so if that's the case, then I'll reduce myself to a fool in hopes that you'll listen to me. He says, you have forced me to boast. But wasn't it funny when we looked at a few weeks ago that Paul didn't boast in everything that God had done through him Paul boasted in his infirmities. Paul boasted in, I was whipped for Jesus five times. I was beaten with rods, immeasurable. I was, I was, he just, I was shipwrecked. I had near-death experiences. He said, but with all of that, my only care was for the church, the well-being of the church. That's an unconditional love. Do you know God loves you unconditionally? You know, it's amazing that... Um, I screw up all the time. And, you know, and it's those things that we do that we go, Lord, I will never do that again. Thank you for forgiving me. I will never do that again. And then I do it again. And I, I, I come just brokenhearted to before the Lord. And, and, and I, I forget to realize that God already knew I was going to blow it. He knows you're going to blow it next week. But he loves you just the same. That's amazing. Because when people wrong us, we can cut them out of our lives. We can build up a wall. We don't have the same forgiveness for others that God had for us. And to look at somebody and say, I know you messed up, but I still love you, is being Christ-like. And Paul had that for the Corinthians. He had that true love. God has a true love for you. So much he cares for you. Every one of you is very special in God's eyes. Very special. And he's going to see you through this. He says, be confident of this, that he that begun the good work in you will complete it. You will make it to heaven. And you will have a new body, and you won't have to wrestle with sin anymore. We won't be able to sin in heaven. It's not like you're going to get up there and go, oh, man, I blew it. Get out of here. God's not going to kick you out. He's going to wrap his arms around you and say, welcome. You're going to have a new body, a body that doesn't sin. You're going to be, in a sense, an image of him. And I'm looking forward to that. But meanwhile, he's placed us here on this earth. We've got another year, another chance, another opportunity to win this community for Jesus Christ. This is the battle. We're not fighting against the government or liberals or cartel or terrorists. We're fighting a spiritual battle that is taking men and women and casting them in hell. And you and I, have the power by the Lord Jesus Christ to yank people out of hell, to lead them right to Jesus' feet and reduce the population of hell. And so he's called you. Are you picking up the phone? God doesn't want you just to come to church. That's great. He doesn't want you just to read the Bible. That's great. 
He wants you to get in the game. And now he's given us another year to get in the game. God has strategically placed you in the workplace to reflect the love of God, to share the love of God, to wait for an opening. People look at you and you want to be mistaken for Jesus because you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And you say, well, I don't know a lot of Scripture. It doesn't matter. Love reflects Jesus Christ. Living right reflects Jesus Christ. Doing the will of God reflects Jesus Christ. Forgiving others reflects Jesus Christ. Being wanting to give of yourself to help somebody else reflects Jesus. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. And he's given us another year to, to, to make that real in our lives. Paul has so desperately been trying to make this real to a church that had basically turned their back on him. Paul was like a spiritual father to them. He led them to the Lord. He started the church. The church was booming. But when he left, the Judaizers snuck in. They started to corrupt it with false doctrine and leading people astray. And then people were getting saved. And they're saying, well, you know, it's saved by faith and keeping the law. And Paul says, that's a damnable doctrine. That's doctrines of demons. We're not saved by anything but faith. It's not by what you do. You can't be saved by your works. Your works are like filthy rags. Our best is as filthy rags. Isaiah tells us that. Our best. Why? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because sin entered into the world and we've all sinned and we know that we've all sinned. Why? Because the results of sin is death and everybody's going to die. That's how you know you're a sinner. And if you say you don't have sin, you just sin. Join the team. And God did the unthinkable. He came down from heaven to die for you so that by you receiving the gift of eternal life, salvation, you would live forever with him. We're eternal beings. You're either going to spend it in heaven or hell. You say, well, I don't believe in heaven or hell. It doesn't change anything. It's still there. You're going to go one place or another. You're an eternal being. The spirit of man inside man is, is uh, it's, I, I'm, what you're looking at, this isn't me. This is a tent. God's got a mansion for me. This is a temporal body. This is, this is Steve, who's old, who feels like inside I'm still 16. And I can drive by on a hole at that skate ramp and go, I can do that. <laughs> but my body says, don't do it. God's love says, don't do it. <laughs> and so Paul is like a parent. But the thing is, as being parents, how many parents we got out there? Okay, you know this. As being a parent, we can't make our kids appreciate us. We can't make our kids appreciate what we do for them. That's something that's not in our control. We can't force them to be grateful. And there's going to be times in their lives that we will deny them of something that they think they need so badly, but we know it's not good for them. And they will, in a sense, hate you. You're so mean. I can't believe everybody else is doing it. But you know that it leads to destruction. And so you say, you can't have that. I'm not going to give that to you because it's not going to be healthy for you. Did you know God does that for you? How many times have you wanted something so badly God said no, and then down the road you, you realize, oh, <laughs> no wonder you didn't want to give it to me. You know best. But during that time, we just think, God, why is God so mean to me? Why is my dad so mean? He loves you so much. He wants the best for you. Paul is their spiritual father. He says, I love you so much and I will continue to love you even though you don't appreciate me. Even though you're not grateful for what God has done through me. What kind of love is this that Paul has for the Corinthians? Well, we're going to see that Paul's love reflects Jesus Christ. And isn't it our goal to be Christ-like? Isn't our goal is for people to look at us and see Jesus? The same heart? And you need to understand that other people will only experience the love of God through you. It's not like God can't pour out a, a just you know a bucket of love over you. And I mean, that's awesome. He does that kind of stuff. But most people are only going to experience the love of God through you. Are you a vessel that God can use? The church 
I think, is more influential as a group to show the love of God more than any other group in the world, on the planet. Nobody on the planet shows the love of God more than Christians. They're Christ's light. They're the hands and feet of Jesus. And I'm even going farther to say that I think that the church, Christians, are more powerful than any military on the planet. Because we deal with something way higher. We deal with eternal life. See, man can only kill the body, but God can kill the soul. And you and I are more powerful because we are in the army of the Lord and we are helping. We are partaking in spreading the good news and seeing people come to Jesus and have eternal life. And isn't that more important than life here? I think so. <clears throat> Paul, in his vulnerability, says, verse 11, I've become a fool in glorying. You've compelled me to that. He, he's saying, I'm making myself vulnerable before you. Doesn't mean he's weak. You know, Jesus was vulnerable. Doesn't mean Jesus was weak. I mean, think about it. He came down from glory, born of a virgin, clothed in flesh, God incarnate. And he chose to live among us, to be mistreated, to be talked down to, to be abused, to be whipped, to be crucified for you. He made himself vulnerable for you. He died on the cross. You guys got to remember that at any time, God could have stopped all of that. But no greater love does a man have than he lays down his life for a friend. And Jesus Christ went to the cross for you because he wanted you to have eternal life and life more abundant. The love of God makes us vulnerable to others to be hurt. How many of you have been hurt since you become a Christian? How many of you have been hurt because you've gone a different direction? Your friends turned away. You're no fun anymore. They don't want anything to do with you. Family turned away. How many of you have been hurt by just sharing your desire that they would be saved? And look at what Paul went through. He was run out of every town practically that he went into. He was beaten everywhere. He saw the bigger picture, though. The people were lost and going to hell, and they needed the gospel. Paul was hurt so badly by the Corinthians, but he kept loving them. That's a word for us. Have you been hurt really bad by somebody? And you stop loving them? You put up a wall? You don't want anything to do with them? It's not the heart of Christ. You need to repent. Ask Jesus to change your heart. If you change your mind, he'll change your heart. Paul loved the Corinthians. He kept loving them. They looked down at him. They thought him less because of his appearance. Remember we talked about his appearance? He was about five foot tall, bull-legged, bald on top, long hair in the back, a ponytail, whatever. Beady eyes. They were kind of pussy and runny, big hooked nose. I mean, he wasn't much to look at. But God likes to do a lot with a little. Doesn't he? Doesn't he use, like, the people you would never expect? You know, I was thinking about this this week, and I was thinking, you know, you know the story of Samson? Everybody knows the story of Samson, right? Strongest guy ever, right? And, you know, we think of Samson, we think 6'5", 300, cut, UFC fighter. Wouldn't it be funny if he looked like Paul? Wouldn't that be just like God to give all this strength to somebody who looks like they couldn't even lift a box? I say that for you that don't think God can use you because you feel like you're nothing. Well, we're going to find out today that nothing is something. God likes to do a lot with nothing. He likes to blow the minds of the world. Paul wasn't much to look at. Not like these Judaizers who were charging large amounts, coming in with these full caravans and all this pomp. Paul wasn't much to look at. He didn't have the big diamond ring. He didn't have the gold chain around his neck. He didn't have, you know, the full entourage, the flashy clothes. He didn't have great speaking skills. He wasn't putting on a big show, a performance. But when it came to teaching the Word of God, when it came to teaching truth, when it came to teaching Bible, none of these other teachers in Corinth could even compare to what God was doing through Paul. 
Paul had the right heart. You know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that we are to pray for our pastors, to greet them with a kiss, to honor them, to reverence them, because they intercede for your souls. And it's not putting them on a pedestal. You should never do that. They're, they're, pastors are no better than anybody else. We're all a work in progress. But he says to honor them, to pray for them, because why? Because they care for your souls. They teach you the Bible. They reveal the true love that God has for you. They're more concerned with you than they are anything else. And if you're here visiting today and you, you, you go to a church that doesn't have love, go find another church. If you're here visiting today and you, you go to a church that doesn't have love and they're not teaching through the Bible, you need to find another church. Go find a church that teaches through the Bible and a, a church that loves you. And when you do that, get involved. Get involved. Get behind the work of God that He's doing in the church that you attend. That's what God wants from you. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, pastor, you're just trying to get us to do something at church. Listen, I am not trying to get you to do something. I'm trying to get you to grow. There's a special grace that's given to a believer who gets involved that you won't get if you don't get involved. I don't, I don't care how much you read the Bible. I don't care how many millions of sermons you've listened to. You will not experience this special grace that God bestows on the one that gets involved unless you get involved. You will never experience what that other person is experiencing. And getting involved only happens when you're fully understanding how much God loves you and how much God has done for you. Listen, you escaped hell. Hello? Isn't that worth something? And thank God we're not saved by doing something for the kingdom. We're saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. But I think because of the grace of God, we take it so lightly not to serve him because I'm saved by grace and not of my works. The depths of God's love is mind-blowing when you stop to think about it. We need to learn to love like Christ. And when we do, that's when we can be used by Christ in a mighty way. Are you grateful for your salvation today? Are you grateful for the love that Jesus has shown you? Are you grateful that you're going to heaven? How do you show them that you're grateful? Do you love others like Christ loves you? Paul loved the Corinthians who had no love for him. God loved you when you had no love for him. That's true love. That's true love. How much does God love you? Well, you know what? Psalm 53, I think, tells us. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And God still loved you. Remember, remember when that was you? You know, that's funny. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Do you guys remember that guy, I don't know, what was it, eight, ten years ago in Florida? That, that was, uh, he got a lawyer, and he went, and he went into a court, and he was demanding uh, that they make a, a national day of atheism. You guys remember that? And he said it was just totally unfair. He spent all this money, he got lawyer's fees, and he, he had a court case and before a judge, and, and, and he was saying, listen, it is just not fair. We need, we need a holiday for atheists. We, you know, the Christians got Christmas, they got Easter, the Jews have Hanukkah and Passover, there's Kwanzaa, there's Boxing Day. We need an atheist day. And he pleaded this case, he spent all this money. And when it was all done, the judge looked at him, he said, sir? Council, you have a day. And they looked at each other shocked, like, we have a day? He goes, you have a day. You have had a day. We weren't aware that we had a day. What day is that? And he said, Psalm 53, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Your day is April 1st. <laughs> but listen to this. Let me read Psalm 53 to you because you're going to see the depths of God's love for you. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are, our, they are corrupt. They have done abominable iniquities. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, 
who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They've gone astray. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now you think that God would look down at that and just flush the toilet and start over. But that's not the love of God. That is true love that in that He still reaches out for us. Romans tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have failed, but God wants to save us. Is that amazing? That's true love. We have all hated God with our conduct, the way that we treat Him. Even as Christians, how many times we turn our back and do things the way we want to do when we know it's wrong. And it's a slap in the face to the one that loves us. And we can do those things so much it doesn't even break our heart anymore. But it breaks the heart of God. God has loved us so much by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. So the question is for you today, do you want to live for God or do you want to live for your flesh? If you say, I want to live for God, then God can do powerful and mighty things. He's working in your heart today. Paul says, I became a fool in glorying that you have compelled me to do this. You ought to have been commended. I ought to have been commended of you. You know, these guys spoke bad of me. You should have stood up. You should have had my back. You didn't. For in nothing I'm behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle, verse 12, were wrought among you in all patience and signs and and wonders and, and mighty deeds. He was being questioned on his apostleship. And he makes this crazy statement. He says, I am an apostle. I'm not any less than these others, than the chiefest of apostles. You know, you can put Peter there. You can put John there. And he said, by the way, throw in all those guys over in Corinth who think they're apostles. I didn't fall behind in anything compared to them. But his statement was this, but I am nothing. Because you know, When God starts using us a lot, we start to think we're something. And then we start looking down at others like, what are you doing for Jesus? What a statement. When I acknowledge that in me is no good thing apart from Jesus Christ, God can work with that. When I realize I can't do anything apart from Him, God can work with that. You know, whenever you see people that are really being used by God in a mighty, mighty way, they will never take the credit. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not share my glory with another. They hold on to that. And when people go, gosh, you've done this, you've done that, they say, you know what, I'm nothing. It was all God. And if in me is no good thing and anything that comes out of me is the only good thing, then that means that was God. Don't take the credit. When I realize that I can't do anything apart from Him, that's when God can really use me. And when I realize that, then I will have love unconditionally for others that don't even love me, who have harmed me. And I'll be committed to love on them and to pray for them. And I will be serving unconditionally because Jesus is worth it. We're not going to get to heaven and go, gosh, you know what? I really served too much. We're not going to get to heaven and go, man, you know what? I really gave too much. I think we'll get there and we'll weep that we didn't serve enough. We didn't give enough. But you know what the Bible tells me? That'll be when the Lord reaches over and he wipes the tears from our eyes. When I can serve expecting nothing in return from others, I'm going to be in a good place. When I serve not based on what I can get, but based on what I can give. Why? Because God has given me so much. Hasn't God blessed you with so much? Jesus said this. He said, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over you, them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, Yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires 
to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be the first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Wow, where did Paul get this stuff? Jesus. Where do we get it from? Paul. Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus. God wants you to be used like he used Paul. But you got to be willing. And you might be here today and say, you know, listen, I, I can't be used by God. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not Paul. I'm not John. I'm not Peter. I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not whoever's out there. Listen, God does not want you to be like them. God wants you to be like him. Paul says in verse 13, For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me for this wrong. This is like spiritual sarcasm right here. He says, as a church, you guys didn't lack anything, except you didn't support me at all. And he goes, oh, forgive me for that. That's, that's spiritual sarcasm. He's saying, listen, I didn't take a dime from you, and you never gave me anything. He says, you weren't inferior to any of the other churches. Corinth was like probably the wealthiest church at that time. They had it all. And they were probably the one New Testament church that exercised the gifts of the Spirit more than anybody else. They had it all going on. But they never did anything to take care of Paul. And I think Paul knew by the power of the Holy Spirit not to take anything from them because it would be held against them later on. You ever done something for someone else and then, and, and then next thing you know, you're like holding it against them? Oh, okay, well, maybe I should turn that around. Somebody did it for you. And, and they did it because they said they just cared. And next thing you know, they expected something. And maybe it was that Paul knew that, you know, you know what, you know, I never took anything from you guys. I never asked for a cent. Other churches took care of me while I was here. I made tents. So you would never be able to say I was in this for the money? I didn't even take a shawarmer from you. You guys know what that is? No? A hero? Sandwich? All right. This is what you give me, Lord. Okay. Because he knew that down the road they'd say, yeah, that Paul, he took my shawarmer. He was in it for the sandwich. <laughs> Paul said, I never took anything from you. He says, verse 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So here Paul says, listen, um, I'm coming again. It's because he cared. Come on, if this was you, think about this. What would you do? They don't like you. They talk bad about you. They don't stand up for you. They say you're not an apostle, blah, this, blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't you just kind of say, fine. Wouldn't you just cut your losses and say, forget it? Not Paul. Can you imagine if second service, because I know you guys wouldn't do it in first service. Can you imagine if second service just said, get out of here, Steve. We don't want you anymore. But if I had the heart of Paul, I'd say, you know what? I love you guys so much. I, I can't eat, breathe, or, or study, or do anything without worrying about your souls and, and your walk with God. I'm coming anyway. That's what Paul says. I'm coming anyway. And Paul says, I'm coming, and I don't want anything from you. I'm not coming for your stuff. I'm not coming for your money. I'm coming because I want you. He was more concerned with their souls, their walk with Jesus Christ, knowing that they were going in the right direction. That's all he wanted. And that's all God wants from you. God doesn't need your stuff. God wants you. That's the heart of God. 
You know, we can give stuff to God, but if we don't give with the right heart, it's not worth anything. We know a lot of people that will give thinking that somehow they're paying off something they did. Or that they'll get some kind of favor by giving. But if you don't give with the right heart, it's no good, right? But you need to understand this, that more than anything, God wants you. And if God has you, then he can use you, and then what you give is given with the right heart, right? But he's not interested in your stuff. Doesn't God own everything? Isn't everything his? Oh, I know you're holding on to stuff. Oh, this is my surfboard. This is my guitar. This is my, no, it's his. He lent it to you. Hello? He's not interested in your stuff. He's interested in you. The thief on the cross was hanging there, and somehow he recognized that this was the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, King, and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he realized, how's this? Check this out. Maybe you never thought about this. He realized that Jesus wasn't going to stay on that cross. And he's hanging there and he's going, Lord, remember me when you come into my kingdom. And Lord, I tell you, if I get my hand free, I could reach into my, my pocket and grab 50 bucks that I stole from somebody and give it to you. Boy, if I could just get down off of this cross, I would sign up for children's ministry. I had to slip that in there. <laughs> and Jesus says, no, you don't get it. I don't, I, I don't want anything from you. I just want you. You know, when we pass the plate around, the, the basket, whatever that thing is, what is it, a sock? What is it? It's a bag, all right? And if you pull out a 20 and you go, whew, everybody see it, drop it in there, and you're like, there, I did it, off the hook. Well, after the service, we'll give you your 20 back because it didn't mean a thing. God didn't say put a 20 in there so you can send up a storm next week. God wants your heart. And when it's given with the right heart, do you know what God really wants when that bag goes around? He wants you to get in the bag. Jump in the bag. Get in the bag. God wants you. Because he knows if he has you, everything else will be given with the right heart. It's all his. In verse 14, he says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. I will not be burdensome to you. I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very, very gladly spend. I will spend all I have and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Isn't that heartbreaking? I would spend everything for you. I would go into debt for you. I, 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 I've come for you, not your stuff, but the more I love you, the less you love me. He says, children ought not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. We've kind of gotten that backwards. Some, some of us are, have this idea like, yeah, boy, you know, yeah, my kids are going to take care of me in the old age. That's not how it's supposed to be. And there's nothing wrong with taking care of our parents. But you've got to understand the idea, it, what he's saying here, is that we should take care of our families. But what, the, 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 the idea, the, the theme of what he's saying here is as parents, we take care of our children and we do it because it's the right thing to do. And our children are oblivious to all the things that we do to them. Your children do not take care of you. Okay? When, when, when we get older, we take care of our, our elderly. I'm not talking about that. But as parents, we are building up an inheritance for our kids. What is that inheritance? To teach them about Jesus Christ. To make sure that we train up our child in the ways of the Lord so when they're older, they won't depart. 
Oh, they may become prodigals. They might dabble in the world, but be confident it's the very thing that he that begun the good work in you will complete it. They will come back. God will finish what he started. But if you got little children running around our house, you can't expect them to take care of you. And God looks at you as his little children, and as the children of God, we have an inheritance. You're grabbing on to anything you got here, let it go. It's nothing to be compared to what's lying ahead for us. God has prepared an inheritance for you. He has laid up treasures for you and me. Did we do that or did God do that? God did it all. He says, I've laid up for you treasures in heaven. Do your kids worry about you paying the bills? <laughs> they ever come, oh, Father, I'm really concerned. I noticed that everybody's been leaving the lights on. That must be very expensive. <laughs> Children benefit from their parents not knowing that they're even benefiting. Right? When you take them to Disneyland, they're blown away. They're running around like, wow, this is all free. Meanwhile, dad's holding his wallet going, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to take out a loan. I can't believe how much these Disney tickets cost. I'm going to go broke. But you don't tell your kids that. You don't go up to your kid and go, honey, listen, I know you're running around having a great time with Mickey Mouse, but you need to know this. Goofy's just robbed me blind. <laughs> you don't say that. Your kids run around the house. They're playing around the house. They're having a good time. They're goofing around. You don't go up and go, do you know how much the mortgage is here? Do you realize what it costs to put food in that refrigerator every week? No, you don't say that. They just expect it. They expect that they have a home, that they have a bed to lay in, that they have clothes. They don't even think twice about it. And God says, stop thinking about your future. I got your future. I've got everything that you need. And boy, when you get here, I'm going to blow your mind. <laughs> Paul is a parent to these Corinthians. He says, listen, I didn't ask anything of you. I don't want your stuff. I don't want your money. I want you. And that's what God's saying to you today. He says, my only concern is your growth in Christ Jesus. But the more I love you, the less I am loved. That breaks my heart, and that breaks some of your hearts because you have been in that same experience. How would you feel if you were Paul and you were being treated like this? Or who in your life is mistreating you? What is God showing us here? Love them anyway. Love them anyway. I'll tell you what, if Paul was my friend, I'd say, Paul, you know what, forget those guys. Let them fall on their face. Let them cry out for help. You know what Paul would say to me? Steve, sit down. You don't know what spirit you have. I love these guys. I'm not going to let go. But Paul, look how they're treating you. I don't care. Paul, they haven't done anything for you. I don't want anything from them. Paul, these guys hate you. Let them go. No, I can't. I love them so much. I won't stop reaching out. Isn't that how Jesus cares about us? In verse 15, he says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I know you don't love me. I know you're talking bad about me. I know you didn't stand up for me. But I will do all I can because I love you so much. Even though I'm not feeling loved by you, I will do all I can. I will spend everything I can. I will go into debt for you just to make sure that you get back on track and that you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. When it says to spend, it means to pay a bill. When it says spent, it means to go into debt. And Paul is saying here, I will gladly give everything for your souls. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He gave it all. Would you do that for others? That's true love. That's true love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for revealing your heart to us, Lord God. And though we don't understand the depths of your love like we should, we understand enough to know that we should trust in you. 
Lord, would you strengthen us in this new year to serve you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning is Communion Sunday. Communion Sunday.